This film is intended for eye surgeons for training and education purposes. Viewer discretion is strongly recommended. Hi friends. He is an elderly gentleman who is having this long-standing mature cataract which is now become intumescent. The slit lamp evaluation revealed a very shallow entry chamber. Actually the pupils were not dilated initially for the fear of him developing pupillary block glaucoma like a phacomorphic variant. So he was administered IV mannitol prior to surgery and then the pupils were dilated and then shifted to the operation room. Before even putting the dye in, it is very obvious to me that uh, the anterior chamber is very shallow, especially at this distal end here. It appears as the distal half of the nucleus is slightly tilting up. I fill the anterior chamber with dispersive OVD, deepening the anterior chamber, and the main 2.8 mm incision is created. The patient is comfortable with topical anesthesia. The anterior capsule is punctured with a 26 G needle and I intend to make a very small primary rexus as part of my plan of the two-stage rexus. The intralenticular pressure is too high in this patient. I end up having a very small rexus. In spite of having used dispersive OVD, the shallow enter chamber in the distal half is quite intimidating. I need to decompress the capsule bag and I'm using my FACO tip to do the same. The machine is set in cortex mode. I prefer the FACO tip as its wider bore allows for quicker decompression of the bag. Since the opening is very small in the eye, I need to be careful of not damaging the anterior capsule. I am using the second instrument to gently nudge the nucleus around so that the swollen cortex behind and in front of it loosens up. But as the cortex is being aspirated, the distal half of the nucleus tilts up momentarily and I could have just this glance of this clear area under the iris. Now I can see this radial fold in the anterior capsule. More folds are seen and the shape of the rexus margin changes. Of course, it's quite obvious now that we have significant zonular weakness in this distal quadrant. Well, again, the lens tilt is quite intimidating at this stage. I come out, inject OE to deepen the chamber. I use cohesive OVD to create some space in the bag. The CTR is then gently threaded into the capsule bag. It's a little tricky to insert it into the small opening. However, compressing the CTR with a second hook minimizes the stretch on the rexus margin and also reduces the stress on the zonules. I dial the CTR to ensure that the entire area of zonular weakness is well supported by the ring. The lens tilt which was initially seen is now not very obvious. It seems that the CTR support is working well. The decompression is continued until I feel it is safe enough to proceed to the secondary rexus. Ovid is injected and then using a micro scissors, a small tangential cut is given. The forceps is then used to complete the larger secondary rexus in a very controlled manner. Time to FACO. I create a very small trench by sculpting the central part of the nucleus so that I get a firm grip on the nucleus before initiating the first vertical chop. The nucleus is subsequently divided into multiple smaller fragments. This is easy because the nucleus is not very dense. But as I begin emulsifying and aspirating these fragments, I feel that the posterior capsule is coming forward, it's bulging forward, that is moving towards the phaco tip. I am able to see this shimmering reflexes of the posterior capsule in the background and as a result I am forced to work more anteriorly. I am working very near to the cornea now actually. I anticipated this issue because of the pre-existing loose zonules. The irrigation fluid would have traversed across the zonules into the burger space and this misdirected fluid is pushing the posterior capsule anteriorly. However, I could manage to remove all the fragments successfully without damaging the posterior capsule. As soon as I come out, we can see the entire capsule bag complex move forward. Well, I should have injected OVD into the eye before coming out. I'm trying to clean up the capsule a little bit by irrigating it with BSS. 
The capsule bag is deepened with viscoelastic. The cortex aspiration is gently begun. We need to remember that it's quite challenging to aspirate the cortex in such a situation because of two factors. There's a progressive forward bulging of the posterior capsule. The anterior capsule and the posterior capsule are literally touching each other. So there's no space in between them for me to go and aspirate the cortex. And secondly, removing the cortex which is entrapped under the CTR again is tricky in these eyes with loose on news. So I increase the infusion pressure a little bit to push back the posterior capsule. Now to aspirate the cortex, the aspiration probe engages the cortex, then it is moved horizontally in a tangential plane to maneuver the trapped cortex from under the CTR and then out of the bag. Now this technique of tangential cortex stripping is beneficial in such situations. There is this moment where the aspiration port has accidentally caught the anterior capsule and we can see the bag getting distorted. However, immediately it is released. A OED is re-injected to deepen the bag and then all the remaining cortex is removed successfully. Time to implant the lens. The bag is filled with OVD and the lens is implanted into it. As the OVD is being removed, again the pressure reappears and the anterior chamber begins to shallow. I'm using diluted transfusion acetate to confirm the absence of any vitreous prolapse. At this point, the patient is uncomfortable and is complaining of pain. So I'm injecting 0.5 ml of lignocaine subconjunctively and this should make him more comfortable. The remaining OVD is subsequently removed. I can see these blobs of viscoelastic, the oily-like thing in the vitreous cavity behind the lens. So we have the irrigating fluid which has gone behind and also the OVD which we injected which, is, which would have traversed across the zonules into the burger space. Time to seal the wounds. I give myself sufficient time to hydrate the side port incisions and the main wound. As I'm doing this, I can see these areas of endothelial damage. Well, there was a lot of maneuvering and manipulation in the antechamber because I was forced to work more anteriorly because of the constant posture pressure induced by the fluid misdirection. Well, this was to be expected. Four hours later, the eye looks alright. There is some corneal edema. The chamber is nice and deep. The intraocular pressures are under control as I have already prescribed him antiglocal medications anticipating a raised intraocular pressure because of the retained OVD inside the eye. To summarize, in this case, we saw how an area of localized zonal adhesions can give access for the fluid to go across the zonules into the burger space and cause misdirected fluid syndrome. And this makes the posterior capsule to bulge forward and makes the subsequent surgical steps quite difficult and increases the potential for posterior capsule tear significantly. So one has to be aware of the risk factors which can cause this phenomenon and one has to take adequate precautions to prevent any further complications. The good thing is it usually subsides in a matter of uh, a few minutes. So being aware and being patient and taking the right steps at the right time is quite critical to prevent any intraoperative complications. Thank you so much for watching and hope this helps.